Welcome everyone. We will be starting the webinar shortly. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. It has been a while since we have brought you an Ollie Wellness Institute webinar. We've been focusing quite a lot on our podcast channel, um, the Olive Wellness Podcast, which explores all evidence-based science and knowledge of all Olive products with world-renowned experts. So please check it out when you can. And one of those amazing products from the Olive Tree is Olive Leaf Extract, which we are exploring in depth today. If you do have any questions, please add them to the Q&A chat box down the bottom of your screen and we will endeavour to get to those towards the end of the webinar. I would now like to introduce our presenter for today, Ian Breakspear. Ian is a naturopath, herbalist and educator with more than 25 years experience. He's currently a senior lecturer at Endeavour College of Natural Health and Ian is also in private clinical practice in Sydney focusing on patients with cardiovascular disease and chronic inflammatory conditions. Ian is a committed leader with the naturopathic profession and has served um, 10 years on the board of the Naturopaths and Herbalists Association of Australia. Ian has also contributed to journal publications and co-authored a chapter on heart disease for a major Australian naturopathic textbook. So welcome, Ian, and thank you so much for your time today. I will now pass over to you. Thanks, Abby, and uh, thank you to the Olive Wellness Institute for inviting me to speak today to you about um, something that's become a bit of a passion of mine over the last few years, which is olive leaf extract. It's uh, get started into having a look at uh, this pretty amazing herbal medicine. Uh, so our objectives for today, what we're going to cover in today's webinar, will be, whoops, sorry, my mouse has just gone a little crazy there. Let me just bring that back. Um, so what we're going to be looking at today is obviously what olive leaf extract is, uh, what kind of form it comes in, how you take it, that kind of thing. We'll be having a look at the evidence relating to both immune and cardiovascular health particularly. Uh, and that evidence will cover both some of the, the pharmacological studies that have been done on it, as well as some of the clinical uh, evidence from human clinical trials. We'll also have a look at some common uh, counselling and practice points uh, that you need to know about for dispensing and recommending and prescribing olive leaf. And I'll also, uh, towards the end, uh, provide you with some of the, the key pieces of information from a research project that I've been involved in for the last couple of years around profiling uh, olive leaf extracts on the marketplace. So let's get started with what is olive leaf extract extract or OLE as we often call it. 
So firstly, it can be made from either fresh or dried leaves of Olea europea, so the olive tree. Um, so obviously the same tree from which we get normal table olives and olive oil and so forth. The common solvents that are used uh, to make olive leaf extract include water, uh, glycerol or glycerin as it's also known, ethanol or sometimes combinations of these, particularly ethanol or water combinations are commonly used in some products. Now, something that's important and we will revisit towards the end when I have a look at the, the results of the research that I've been doing is to expect that there's gonna be some degree of variation in chemistry between different olive leaf extracts. Uh, obviously, depending on how you make it, what kind of solvents you use, the extraction methods, and even things like the olive cultivars or whether you use dry or fresh leaf in preparing the extract will change the chemistry somewhat. And sometimes that's something we do need to understand about herbal medicinal products is that chemistry variation can occur uh, and we need to understand this effectively so we can optimise what kind of prescriptions we give of these plant products. So once it's turned into an extract, how, how can we administer it to patients? Well, the main preparation forms that are available are liquid preparations for oral usage. And sometimes this is just alone, so olive leaf extract only. Sometimes it's in combination with other herbs and it can sometimes be flavored or unflavored as well. Then we've got also tablets and capsules. Uh, so in this case, essentially the extract that's been made from the olive leaf uh, is actually reduced so that the solvent is eliminated uh, into a concentrate so that it can be put into tablets and capsules. So let's have a look now at the chemistry of olive leaf extract. Uh, and I want to emphasize here the concept of irreducible complexity. Uh, like most medicinal plant products, olive leaf is chemically complex and that is indeed part of its virtue. Uh, we need to understand that trying to reduce the activity of a plant product to one or two chemicals often misses the point. Uh, and the entirety of the chemistry can be very, very important in the overall activity of the plant. So what are the main constituents here, olive leaf extract? Uh, predominantly, we've got a range of, of chemicals collectively referred to as biophenols. Uh, now we can subdivide these and the main ones that we see in olive leaf extract uh, a series of what are called secoiridoids, including olirupine and oleacin, some phenyl ethanoids, uh, including hydroxytyrosol, as well as a whole range of flavonoids. And as we said, this complexity is very important. And we're going to show shortly why that is the case with some of the research that's been done on olive leaf extract. Here you can see two of the structures. So on the left there, olirupine, uh, which is what we call the secoiridoid glycoside. So right at the bottom, you can see a glucose unit attached, uh, which is what signifies that it's a glycoside. Uh, you'll also notice on the right there, hydroxytyrosol. Now you can see the structural similarities between olirupine and hydroxytyrosol. Uh, you can see in the upper right area of olirupine, it, it resembles hydroxytyrosol. And this is important because hydroxytyrosol or HT as we often call it, is a degradation product of olirupine. So part of, of what happens when olirupine breaks down, uh, both in preparations, but also in the body, is that it produces hydroxytyrosol. Now, we often get questions around how does olive leaf compare to extra virgin olive oil? Uh, and whilst it's from the same plant, uh, it's really not a lot of comparison, uh, certainly not a lot of comparison chemically, because obviously you've got the oil being extracted out of the fruit, uh, versus various particularly water soluble constituents being extracted out of the leaf. So we get a very different profile and you can quite clearly see that here where some of these biophenols that we've been talking about like olirupine and hydroxytyrosol and the total biophenols are much, much, much higher in OLE versus extra virgin olive oil. 
Now, that's not to say that extra virgin olive oil has, you know, negligible amounts. Uh, certainly the research indicates that the content of olirupine, uh, particularly in good quality extra virgin olive oil, is very important in its overall health benefits. But we can see that if you need to optimise the level of olirupine or hydroxytyrosol, then olive leaf is a better choice. Uh, Extra virgin olive oil gives you a whole range of other beneficial constituents. You've got things like squalene and the various uh, fatty acids and triterpenoids that are present in much higher levels in the oil than they are in the OLE. So, you know, they're, they're pretty much different uh, substances. Uh, you can't compare them. And essentially, in my opinion, you should have both. Uh, nothing beats having a good quality extra virgin olive oil in your diet and using uh, OLE as a medicine when required. So let's have a look now at the pharmacology of olive leaf extracts. So we're going to look at some information on the pharmacology of individual constituents, as well as some on the total extract here as well. So this is a, a slide summarising some of the, the key uh, areas of, of medicinal activity and the interlinkage of some of these uh, areas of medicinal activity from olive leaf. So we can broadly say that uh, overall, it's immune and infectious disease and cardiovascular and metabolic disease that are two main areas of uh, expertise, if you like, for olive leaf extract in terms of what it achieves very effectively. Uh, in terms of the immune and infectious disease side, we see some antibacterial and antiviral effects. Uh, we see a stimulation in phagocytosis. Uh, but we also see anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, which overlap as well with the cardiovascular and metabolic disease activities. Uh, as we know, in both infectious disease and in cardiovascular disease, inflammation and oxidative damage uh, is really important in the understanding of the overall conditions and how it affects patients. So we have a, an interlinkage there. Uh, we also see some specific cardiovascular activities being antihypertensive, hyperlipidemic, and also improving insulin sensitivity as well. So let's have a look now at the anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, so olirupine itself has been shown to reduce leukotriene B4 production, as well as tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin 1 beta production. Maslinic acid, which is another component in an olive leaf extract, and it's not in high levels, but a good olive leaf extract will have some present. Uh, it's also been shown to modulate nitric oxide production and inducible nitric oxide gene expression as well. It also uh, modulates interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha expression and cyclooxygenase-2 activity. And some research suggests that it may reduce nuclear factor CAFA-B activity as well. So you, as you can see with this, it's affecting a whole range of different inflammatory mediators. It's not just targeting one or two inflammatory mediators, but it's targeting a lot of them. And the modulation aspect is something that's important as well. Uh, with a lot of herbal medicines, what we see, partly because of the complex chemistry of them, is not just a unidirectional activity. It's not just pushing the physiology in one direction, uh, but instead it's modulating uh, physiological function. So that rather than uh, boost or suppressing all the time. It, it tries to bring things back to that middle ground of what should be good health. Looking at the antioxidant activity, uh, olirupine has been shown to reduce LDL oxidation, uh, also reducing urinary excretion of some of your lipid peroxidation byproducts like 8-isoprostaglandin F2-alpha. Uh, so this indicates that you've got less fatty oxidation occurring within the body. 
The total biophenols uh, have also been shown to exhibit synergistic antioxidant behaviour in vitro. Uh, and this is again uh, reinforcing what we said earlier about the, the complexity of the chemistry being very, very essential in the overall uh, activity of the plant. If you just give one or two antioxidant chemicals, um, sure, you can measure antioxidant change, but sometimes it won't be the most beneficial change either. So total biophenols having that synergistic effect will be very, very beneficial here. Now looking at antihypertensive effects, um, the exact antihypertensive mechanism of OLE is, is still really not fully understood. Uh, we do have some in vitro evidence of components of its activity, but some of the, the clinical research versus the in vitro research indicates that there's aspects of its it's antihypertensive effect that we still don't fully understand. Uh, essentially the sum of, of what we do understand from in vitro evidence doesn't add up to what we see in clinical usage. Uh, so in other words, we're seeing higher levels of response usually in practice than what we would expect from just the in vitro evidence. But what we do know uh, is that there is some combination of ACE inhibiting effect as well as calcium channel blocking along with restoration of normal endothelial function within the vascular system. Uh, and this I think is very, very key here again, where we're looking at restoration of normal function. And that's a you know, positive benefit here. Now the hypolipidemic and anti-atherogenic effect, uh, looking at studies in rats, we've seen that olirupine, hydroxytyrosol, and the whole OLE extracts, uh, all of them reduce total cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides, and also can normalize HDL and LDL ratios. Hydroxytyrosol itself has demonstrated anti-inflammatory and antiplatelet, as well as antioxidant activity in vitro and in in vivo animal studies as well. Looking at the hypoglycemic and the anti-diabetic effects, uh, in vivo research in diabetic rats and mice indicate that olirupine and hydroxytyrosol have a dose-dependent effect in lowering blood glucose and also increasing hepatic glycogen. Uh, and what that indicates to us as well is that there's a, a de subsequent decrease in glycogenolysis in diabetics, which as we know is a bit of an issue. Uh, that whole dysregulation of carbohydrate metabolism in diabetic patients uh, is a big part of the, the total pathology of diabetes. So being able to reduce uh, the hepatic glycogenolysis will mean that there'll be less likelihood of sustained blood glucose levels at a, a higher than desirable elevation. The total biophenols are also potent inhibitors of advanced glycation end products in various animal studies. So this indicates that not only will it have a positive effect on reducing blood glucose and improving carbohydrate regulation, but it may also reduce the formation of some of your chronic complications of diabetes. Uh, so some of the cardiovascular complications, the renal complications, the neurological complications and so forth, we, we see that the advanced glycation end products, so the, the proteins that are damaged in tissues because of sustained elevations in blood glucose, this is part of what leads to these chronic complications. So ideally we want better blood glucose control, but if we can also reduce glycation of various proteins, we will likely reduce the chronic complications of diabetes in patients as well. So the antimicrobial effect now, um, and obviously this is something people are probably very interested in at the moment. Um, you know, something I want to emphasize here is that olirupine at a very close relative called ligris, lig, sorry, ligstricide, uh, what we call in herbal medicine phytoanticipins. Now, a phytoanticipin is a, a substance present in the plant that will be present in normal functional plant material. Uh, so in other words, living plant tissue that's healthy. 
uh, and will act as an antimicrobial defense for the plant, uh, or else it will be a precursor to the formation of an antimicrobial substance when the plant needs it. Uh, the key with a phytoanticipin versus a phytoalexin is that phytoalexins are only produced by the plant when the plant is threatened with infection, whereas a phytoanticipin is present either naturally in the plant before the infection occurs or as a precursor in the plant. So it's interesting that you know we use it as an antimicrobial as well, uh, but that comes from the plant's own microbial defenses. So olirupine has been demonstrated in vitro studies to act against respiratory syncytial virus uh, and also parainfluenza type three virus as well. Uh, and in vitro studies indicate that it may also prevent viral entry into the cells for at least HSV1, uh, may also reduce HIV1 cell to cell transmission and viral replication. Uh, so we definitely need a lot more research on the activity, the antimicrobial activity uh, of olive leaf and, and its various components, but it's very, very promising there. And we'll also come to some human clinical usage and look at some of the historical usage as an antimicrobial shortly as well. So let's have a look now at clinical usage and the evidence uh, from human clinical usage. So we're going to start with cardiovascular risk reduction and have a look at this study published in Phytomedicine in 2011 uh, that looked at olive leaf extract in patients with stage one hypertension and its comparative effectiveness with captopril. So the method uh, for this study was double blind, double dummy RCT. It was a four week dietary only run in with an eight week treatment period. And the participants were 232 patients with stage one hypertension. And the exclusions were secondary hypertension, renal failure, heart failure, myocardial infarction or stroke within the last six months, valvular disease, secondary or third, sorry, second or third degree heart block, uh, and pregnant or breastfeeding females. Now the groups used, uh, one took OLE, a standardized preparation, standardized for 19.9% olirupine. Uh, plus a captopril dummy. Uh, and the other group was captopril 12.5 milligrams twice daily, titrated to 25 milligrams twice daily at the end of week two in non-responders, plus the OLE dummy. Now, the results on the per protocol analysis for blood pressure, uh, and this is quoting from the authors of the study, comparable blood pressure lowering effect to that shown by captopril, the difference between groups in terms of reduction of systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure were found statistically and clinically insignificant. So that's pretty positive results here, looking uh, essentially saying that olive leaf is giving comparable efficacy in stage one hypertensive patients to a standard conventional approach of captopril. Looking at the per protocol analysis for blood lipids, uh, there was a significant reduction in total cholesterol and triglyceride levels in the OLE group, but of course, no change with the captopril, which is you know, expected. It doesn't have any known lipid lowering effects. Uh, the subgroup of patients that took the OLE that had a very high baseline triglyceride levels had up to a 23% reduction at week eight, which is pretty clinically significant there. There was also a slight reduction in LDL from baseline and no effect on HDL. So discussing and limitations of this study, uh, we do need to note that another eight week study of 40 borderline hypertensive monozygotic twins showed only a minor reduction using the same type of extract at the same dosage. So only a, a relatively small effect. Uh, but what they did notice in this study was a more clinically significant effect at 100 milligrams daily, uh, sorry, 1,000 milligrams daily of the extract, uh, which equates to roughly 200 milligrams of olirupine per day. 
Now, looking at the clinical evidence around pre-diabetic states and type 2 diabetes, so again, just pulling out uh, one interesting paper here, uh, looking at insulin sensitivity in overweight males. So this was a double-blind uh, placebo-controlled crossover RCT, 12 weeks of intervention with a six-week washout period. It enrolled 46 overweight males aged between 35 and 55 years. And the exclusions were illicit drug or tobacco use, diabetes, any medications likely to affect insulin sensitivity, or if they were on antihypertensives or hyperlipidemics, uh, and had a stable dose uh, for at least six months prior. They were also instructed, all of the patients were instructed not to make changes to the diet or physical activity during the trial. The groups were OLE in safflow oil, four capsules daily. Uh, and this was standardized to 51.1 milligrams of olirupine and 9.7 milligrams of hydroxytyrosol per day and a safflower oil placebo capsule. Now the results, uh, the OLE group with the intention to treat analysis, 15% uh, improvement in insulin sensitivity, 28% improvement in pancreatic beta cell function, 32% increase in interleukin-6 with no observed changes in IL-8 or TNF-alpha or C-reactive protein either. And no significant changes in lipids, blood pressure and carotid intima media thickness. Safety, uh, there was one adverse event reported which led to withdrawal, uh, but when the study was unblinded, it was revealed he was on the placebo, not the olive leaf extract. Uh, and there were no changes in LFTs observed during the, the study, so no changes in liver function tests. Now, the discussion here from the authors, we speculate that the observed improvement in insulin sensitivity with OLE is greater than would have otherwise been observed if our subjects had been treated with metformin instead. OLE also improved insulin secretion to further aid glucose regu regulation, which does not occur with the use of metformin. Now limitations here, it was interesting to note that there was no impact on the blood lipids or the blood pressure in these patients, um, as opposed to what had been observed in some of the prior studies that we've talked about. Um, now this may be in part due to a relatively low dose of olirupine compared to some of the other trials at just over 50 milligrams per day. That's lower than some of the other cardiovascular trials that have been around 100 milligrams of olirupine equivalent per day. Uh, so it does warrant further investigation, especially some dose response studies. You know, we, we can see so far a bit of a trend to around 100 milligrams of olirupine being valuable in a number of cardiovascular issues. Uh, but what would be great would be to see a number of different dose response studies done to really establish greater accuracy of that dosing over time. So let's look now at some clinical evidence around the infection, inflammation, and its use in immune compromised states as well. So we start with traditional use, and this is uh, probably the main thing that olive leaf has been known for traditionally. And it starts, uh, at least in, in our modern understanding, with early 19th century Spanish doctors prescribing it as a febrifuge, so using it in fevers, uh, and the usage spreading from there to England. Uh, Daniel Hanbury in 1854, he was a botanist and pharmacognosist, uh, reported in the pharmaceutical journal his use of olive leaf to treat fever and malaria. Uh, and I was actually lucky enough to track down the original uh, text of this uh, a little while ago. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it would have been late last year. Uh, it's often referred to uh, in other journal papers and in things like this EMA review that was done in 2017. Uh, but it's been very hard to find the full text. So I was lucky enough to find the full text and, and be able to actually read that recently. So yeah, very interesting to see that historical usage. There's also been a lot of uh, anecdotal reports of olive leaf reducing severity and duration of various respiratory viral infections. And also the gargling the tea may alleviate pharyngitis. 
uh, and speaking to some Greek herbalists, uh, this is something that has been known within that culture for a long time. Uh, the gargling the tea of olive leaves is, is something good for a sore throat. So looking at, at some of the uh, human research here, uh, this one is a, an interesting one, looking at the use of olive leaf extract for oral mucositis in chemotherapy patients. So the method here was a randomized double-blind placebo controlled crossover study with a comparator medication. 15 day duration of treatment during each phase with crossover occurring during the different cycles of chemotherapy as they were commenced. The participants were 40 uh, screened, nine were excluded because of diabetes or uh, additional radiotherapy. 31 ended up being randomized and 25 completed. So not a huge study, uh, but you know, still something interesting here. Uh, the groups, uh, so a mouth rinse solution was used three to four times daily for 14 days. And the mouth rinse solutions varied between OLE at 330 milligrams per mil in the, the solution. We don't know what it was standardized for. That wasn't actually reported in the study. Uh, then the benzodiamine uh, hydrochloride was used as the comparator medication and normal saline was used as placebo. The outcome measures used were the oral mucositis assessment scale, the WHO score and salivary assays as secondary measures looking at interleukin 1-beta and TNF-alpha as well. So these are, are the results here and what we see from these tables from the papers themselves excuse me, is that there was particularly at day eight and day 15, uh, generally considerably greater improvement. Uh, so on the OMAS score, uh, it was much lower with olive leaf uh, than what it was with benzodiamine or with placebo, obviously, at day eight and day 15. Uh, the WHO grade uh, as well showed a similar kind of response. So the limitations of this study, um, it is a small size, a small number of participants, so we do have to consider that. Uh, what was interesting to note here as well was that the OLE group had significantly higher TNF-alpha and interleukin-1-beta levels at baseline compared to the benzodiamine group as well as compared to the placebo saline group. However, the post-treatment means were still lower for the OLE compared to other groups, with the OLE being the only one to show a statistically significant change in the secondary outcome measures. So this, again, is kind of reflective of that anti-inflammatory uh, aspect of OLE leaf that we know from the in vitro work. Another paper here uh, was a, a clinical trial done on high school athletes looking at whether olive would reduce the upper respiratory tract illnesses in these high school athletes. So this was a New Zealand study, randomised double-blind placebo controlled, 32 healthy high school students between 16 to 19 years, uh, excluded uh, any patients that had uh, supplements in the previous three months. It was for nine weeks during the competitive season and the interventions used were OLE, tablets equivalent to 20 grams of dry leaf containing 100 milligrams of olorepine per day and a placebo containing gluten-free cornstarch. Now, now the results, uh, there was no significant difference in incidence of upper tract infections. But in those that did acquire uh, upper respiratory tract infection, the average duration of the infection was lower in the OLE group, so 9.7 days versus 12.3 in the placebo group. And there was a 28% reduction in sick days in the OLE group versus placebo. 
The OLE group also appeared to have greater soreness and stress levels when controlled for training load. And this is interesting. We don't uh, fully understand why this is. Um, it may be just an, uh, some aberration given the small number of participants, uh, but it's something that's worthy of exploration here as well. Five participants had adverse events. Four of those were in the OLE group and they were stomach ache and headache and bad skin and acne. So that summarizes uh, some of the key human clinical trials that we know about uh, for olive leaf extract at the moment uh, in the key areas of its usefulness. What we're gonna look at now briefly is some promising activity that does require a lot more human research uh, to really establish the, the validity and the usefulness here. So neuroprotective activity. Uh, there's some in vitro research indicating that olirupine may reduce amyloid plaque formation and deposition, uh, indicating there may be a role in conditions like Alzheimer's, for instance. Uh, OLE also reduced infarct volume, brain edema, and blood-brain barrier permeability, as well as neurological deficit scores in rats that had an induced cerebral artery inclusion. Uh, so that is kind of consistent with its uh, firstly vascular endothelial normalization effect, but also its antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects. The anti-cancer and anti-antigenic effect. Um, this is interesting in uh, in vitro research, uh, plus some epidemiological evidence that indicate lower incidence of some types of cancer that's associated with the Mediterranean diet. And obviously we need to realize that there's a whole level of complexity to the Mediterranean diet. Uh, but as we know, olive products are a big part of that Mediterranean diet. So there's an interesting area of exploration that needs to occur there. Also, olirupine has demonstrated anti-proliferative, anti-angiogenic, and antioxidant activity in vitro, as we've seen. Uh, so, you know, worthy of further exploration here. So let's have a look now at some safety and patient counselling points. Uh, so we're going to go through some things that you need to know uh, if you are advising patients take olive leaf extract. Uh, what are some of the limitations? What are some of the cautions? As well as when it will be most useful. So looking at the adverse events that have been reported in the OLE versus Captopril study, uh, so a total of 1,057 adverse events were reported by the 168 uh, study subjects. 83 uh, of those belonged to the OLE group, 85 belonged to the Captopril group. The majority of the adverse events though were tolerably mild and comparable between the groups. There was one serious adverse event in the OLE group, uh, and this was severe anemia following persistent mineralgia, um, and obviously that was judged as being unrelated to the OLE. So as we know, you know in a well-designed clinical trial, any adverse event that occurs in a subject during the duration of the trial needs to be uh, reported and needs to be considered as being potentially linked to the study medication or the placebo. Uh, what we find though in obviously a lot of studies is that once things are looked at in, in more detail, when each individual adverse event is looked at, quite a lot of those are not likely to be directly related to either the placebo, the comparative medications, or the active medications that's being investigated as well. And this is a clear example of, of where it's pretty sure that it's not due to persistent and that OLE has not caused persistent mineralgia. The European Medicines Agency report on olive leaf extract and olive leaf in general, um, there and quoting from their report, the safety profile of olive leaf extracts can be described as acceptable from the existing clinical studies and from its use of products on the market. The safety results obtained from the clinical studies conducted so far show that the oral use of olive leaf extracts are well tolerated by most patients. The majority of adverse events were tolerably mild, while the most common ones, 5% of the total events observed during the studies, were coughing and vertigo. Less frequently, muscle discomfort and headache were reported. 
And I find this interesting in that the muscle discomfort and headache uh, is kind of consistent with that New Zealand uh, research that we saw in the uh, the high school students that were elite athletes. So it'd be, as we said, interesting to investigate that a little bit more and see whether there is a linkage there or not. Um, and whether it's something that may be due to uh, an interaction with their kind of elite uh, training level versus the average person. Uh, also looking at interactions, and again, this is from the EMA report, there are no reported drug related serious or moderate adverse events. It is proposed in the literature that olive leaf extract preparations administered to patients with biliary tract stones could cause a risk of biliary colic through promoting the secretion of bile. Uh, and we do need to be aware that, you know, this is a caution we find with herbal medicines that have a strong bitter taste. Uh, and what we see with olirupine, it's a saccharidoid. Most of the saccharidoids are very strong in bitter flavor. Uh, and that bitter activity does actually lead to increased secretion of a lot of digestive uh, secretions, including bile. So it is a potential uh, issue there. Uh, it's not being reported as a significant issue in patients, but it's something we should just be aware of as a potential. Any hypertensive drugs and olive leaf extract, uh, whilst we don't have any direct uh, issues that have been reported in the literature that we're aware of, uh, there is the potential for an additive effect, which is common sense here. So obviously consulting a healthcare practitioner prior to using olive leaf extract, if the patient's already taking any hypertensive medications. Similarly with hypoglycemic agents, you know, a possible additive effect, and again, you know, they should be under the care of a healthcare professional uh, to evaluate what, if any, reactions and interactions do occur there. And so dosages of whatever medications can be adjusted as necessary. Contraindications and precautions. Um, hypersensitivity, of course, to olive leaf extract and any uh, other plants in the oleaceae family uh, would be a good contraindication here. Safety during pregnancy and breastfeeding has not been established. We, we don't have any reason to suspect that there will be a problem based on the in vitro studies, based on what we know about the individual constituents, but obviously it hasn't been investigated in pregnant or breastfeeding females. So you know, we do need to be aware of that limitation. In cases of renal disorders or patients taking diuretics, uh, again, consult a healthcare professional prior to use. Uh, there is some evidence that there is a mild diuretic effect from olive leaf there as well. So again, it makes sense that they are under the care of a healthcare professional before starting something like olive leaf. So how can we administer olive leaf? So tablets, capsules and oral liquid extracts are available. Uh, so for oral and nasopharyngeal infections and inflammations, I would advise using a liquid preparation. Uh, and the reason being is that we've seen from the research as well as from traditional evidence that there appears to be a good local activity in the pharyngeal area, particularly the oropharyngeal area. So having that a direct contact of a liquid uh, within the mouth and the, the throat area would be advised to help further reduce inflammation and potentially reduce viral invasion within the cells in those areas as well. With some of the saccharidoids like olirupine, uh, obviously that can be disguised somewhat by flavoring agents if necessary. Uh, the bitterness can be diluted through dilution of each dosage with water as necessary. Uh, but also we do need to note that some olive leaf extracts are extracted using water and glycerol. And of course, glycerol is naturally sweet. Uh, so that can disguise some of the bitterness as well. The olirupine dosage is something we do need to consider here. Uh, the research indicates 
approximately 50 to 100 milligrams of olirupine per day uh, is going to be useful for most indications and potentially slightly higher levels than that for antihypertensive effects. Duration of use for respiratory infections, we're looking at around two to four weeks generally is the recommendation. For cardiovascular risk reduction, we're likely looking at continual usage in prevention or in secondary prevention here. For diabetes and pre-diabetic states, similarly likely continual, and continual usage. And again, making sure that all healthcare providers are aware that the patient is taking OLE and what type it is and what dosage they're taking as well. Uh, we, we need to ensure that patients communicate this across all of their healthcare providers. Uh, it's something that is not communicated as well as it should be. Plenty of research indicates that patients are not discussing complementary medicines usage with a lot of their doctors as much as they should do. So we need to try and change that culture as much as possible. So what we're going to do now is have a, a brief a look at uh, some of the research that I've been doing with Claudia uh, from the Modern Olives Lab, uh, looking at olive leaf extracts on the Australian marketplace and how they compare phytochemically. So this is just a, a little slide showing you uh, at work. So, so you can see the back of my head here in the left slide uh, and you can see the shoulder repeat in the lab. Uh, and what we're doing here is uh, part of the separation necessary to analyze the various triterpenes and sterols within olive leaf extract. And we can see the gas chromatograph machine in the middle and also part of the TLC plate preparation uh, for the sterile analysis as well. So just a little bit of a visual cue to, to show you the, the lab stuff here. So what I wanted to do here was look at uh, the comparison of different over-the-counter products and different practitioner products on the Australian marketplace and compare their phytochemical profiles to see how consistent and how similar they were or how different they were. So these were the over-the-counter products uh, that I looked at uh, and obviously all of their details, their Rostel numbers, drug extract ratios, batch numbers and so forth. And similarly here with practitioner products. So these are products available to herbalists, naturopaths and even pharmacists and doctors if they want to dispense them as well. Uh, so another five uh, products here that are practitioner based. And what I'm just going to present here is a snapshot of part of the research. Uh, so this is looking at olirupine levels, parts per million uh, in the extracts. So you can see there's quite a wide variation between different extracts. But what we see here is an interesting trend where in general, practitioner products tend to be lower in olirupine concentration than over-the-counter products. When we look at hydroxytyrosol, we see the reverse. Uh, we see the practitioner products tend to be higher in olirupine, uh, sorry, in hydroxytyrosol uh, than the OTC products. Looking at dosage recommendations as well, there was quite a lot of variability here. And what we saw with a trend uh, here was that the daily adult uh, ranges or maximum levels were often higher for the OTC products than the practitioner products. And I found this quite uh, interesting. The practitioner products are mostly for extemporaneous dispensing within the context of individual patient care. So obviously a, a practitioner has the ability to adjust dosage depending on what they think is relevant for that individual patient, whereas the others are obviously just over-the-counter products, you know, standard dosing. Uh, so if anything, I would have expected the maximum levels to be lower for OTC than practitioner products, but in general we saw the opposite. Looking at olirupine per maximum dosage, uh, this then shows very clearly the OTC uh, products are very superior in terms of olirupine content per maximum dosage, partly because in general, higher concentration, but also because of the higher maximum dosage that we looked at earlier. 
So that's it for uh, my research and the summary of the OLE. Um, so thank you for your time. And obviously now we want to open up to questions here as well. So I can see that uh, some questions have been put in the Q&A. So let's have a look at what we have here. Okay, so the first one uh, was a question asking, are you aware of the level of reduction of the LDL and triglycerides? And has this been shown in human studies or only mice and rats? Um, yes, we do have some human studies showing reduction in uh, triglycerides particularly, uh, but also some reduction in LDLs as well. Uh, and the, the level of reduction has been generally clinically significant. The LDL in some of the studies hasn't been clinically significant. Uh, and I think one of those studies from memory, the oliruppine level was relatively low anyway. So I think that'd be something worth investigating further is what is the responsiveness at higher dosages. Okay, we have a, uh, another comment here. Captopril rarely used these days, an opportunity to involve newer and more commonly used antihypertensives. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that would be excellent. Uh, you know, the more we understand of its comparative antihypertensive effect to other medications, so, you know, angiotensin II receptor blockers and so forth, uh, that would be fantastic. So, yeah, room for more clinical trials, that's for sure. Okay, next one, uh, taking OLE in solution may cause stomach to get uncomfortable. Is there a way to reduce such effect? Um, if take a tablet, will we have the same effect as taking the liquid form? Um, really good question there. Uh, the, the uncomfortable effect that some people get with OLE uh, in their upper GIT is directly related to the bitterness of the sacroiridoid glycoside. So essentially, as we said, that does stimulate digestive function and sometimes at that higher dosage can over to stimulate digestion in those people. So yes, tablets and capsules can reduce that effect because we, we know from research on bitter substances that part of the activity that we see is due to a neurological mechanism mechanism from the sensation of the taste leading to a neurological effect in the brain and subsequent neurological changes in vagal uh, responses in the, the GIT. So by reducing the taste aspect, so in other words, tablet capsules, you ha do have the potential to reduce that, you know, discomfort that some people get. And that can sometimes be a, a, a bit like the, the kind of sensation you get when you are really hungry and haven't eaten for a long period of time, a kind of gnawing, uh, almost uh, spasm in the GIT. Uh, that is what some patients do report there. So yeah, try tablets and capsules. Uh, so the next question, I would like to know uh, in case 50 milligram dose in human didn't show effect. So what is the dosage of mice would be? I'm working on a vivo study of Alzheimer's with low dose uh, adjusted based on 50 milligram of human dose. Okay, so that's something I, I can't directly answer here uh, because obviously my area of expertise is not animal research and I haven't conducted any animal research per se. So I'm not exactly sure how you would go about extrapolating from that, but certainly from my reading of human research, um, getting up to around 100 milligrams of oliropine per day is where we tend to see the better results in most of the studies. So whatever method that you would have of extrapolating that to the, the mice dosage, that would be appropriate. I know generally things are often done based on body weight, uh, but yeah, it, it's something that I uh, unfortunately can't give you an exact answer for. Um, so another question here, useful in protection against viral infections? Um, yes, uh, certainly there's a lot of traditional evidence that indicates that and a lot of anecdotal evidence as well. There is some pharmacological evidence suggesting that viral invasion of cells is reduced uh, 
with olive leaf and you know it's interesting to note that kind of traditional gargling of olive leaf tea uh, during early stage pharyngitis as well which indicates not just potentially an anti-inflammatory effect but potentially preventing viral invasion uh, and subsequently therefore reducing the, the uh, uh, systemic symptoms in patients as well. Um, another interesting one here, any room for mental health research? Um, that's fascinating and I haven't been, I'm not aware of anything so far in olive leaf in mental health, uh, other than this potential aspect around uh, reducing Alzheimer's, um, you know, the amyloid plaques and things uh, might be interesting. What is interesting is we are seeing more and more general research out there on anti-inflammatory plant diets and anti-inflammatory uh, herbal medicines having positive effects on things like mood and cognitive function and you know, some psychiatric disorders as well. So there's potential there. Uh, I think it'd be worth investigating, um, but yeah, not to my knowledge uh, has there been anything published to date on that. Uh, another question here, improvements in HDL triglyceride ratio. Um, what are the improvements there? Uh, I honestly cannot remember off the top of my head there, but the, what I can remember is that the majority of the impact uh, in terms of clinical uh, significance tends to be more on the triglycerides than the HDLs and LDLs. Uh, the improvement in actual HDL levels is less than the reduction in the LDL levels tends to be when olive leaf is studied there. So it doesn't tend to ramp up HDL as much as it does reducing LDL. Uh, next one here, are OLE used in any food products that are trustable? Um, yeah, uh, that is really good question. Uh, there are some olive leaf teas out there as well, um, just plain olive leaf, but also mixed with some other herbs as well. Uh, sometimes like green tea, uh, sometimes other uh, herbs that it might be used for antioxidant value or immune defense and things like that. So yeah, there are some out there. Uh, I don't want to make any specific product recommendations here, uh, but yes, there are definitely some out there. Um, in addition to metformin for the pre-diabetic individual, efficacy and side effects. Uh, so I'm not quite sure exactly what you're asking uh, uh, there. So I'll attempt to answer it, but please you know, ask anything more uh, if I haven't fully answered the question. So pre-diabetic individuals, um, it seems from the research so far, similar efficacy to metformin uh, from memory. I think it was less side effects than metformin. Uh, so yeah, that seems pretty positive uh, in the pre-diabetic individuals. Ah, uh, oh, Michael, I haven't uh, spoken to you in ages. Um, any insights on OLE production to support uh, I'm assuming osteoarthritis stabilization uh, and Anything on isomers and efficacy? Um, I might get you to elaborate on that in the questions if you can, Michael, and clarify in exactly what you're meaning on that. So, okay. Just move on to the other one while Michael does that. Um, any special methods required to extract olive leaf? Um, uh, yes, uh, there's obviously a lot of research that goes into good production of olive leaf, uh, ranging from the cultivar use to the, the extraction method. Um, certainly what I found interesting from my research was that ethanol as a component of extraction didn't seem to confer any advantages as a solvent. Uh, so I found that quite interesting given that a lot of herbal medicines are extracted using water and ethanol. Uh, so yeah, obviously each company will have their different methods of production as well. 
another one here, does the time when the leaf is harvested make any difference on nutritional levels? Yes, definitely. Um, what we do know from most plants is that we, we end up finding that the plant chemistry changes you know, sometimes hour to hour, certainly day to day, week to week, month to month. Uh, so yes, harvest time will make a difference there as well. Uh, sorry, Michael, okay, so I misread that. Um, you've mentioned uh, it's not uh, osteoarthritis, but the oleoropene glycone. Um, yeah, so that one's interesting. And I think we need a bit more work to see how production will affect it. Um, from my research, uh, it looks like the fresh leaf, uh, production using fresh leaf, maximizes the olirupine itself uh, and there's certainly less hydroxytyrosol indicating less degradation of the olirupine in those products versus dry products. So yeah, this I think is, is I think key from my research uh, and it's something I think that would be worth addressing with a lot of companies as to whether they're looking at uh, adopting the, the fresh leaf as their extraction starting point. And I think we're running pretty much out of time here. Abby, do we have any more time at all for questions? Ian, yeah, I think one has just popped up down the bottom. If you're happy to answer it, yeah, we can take one more. Yep, sure. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. So in addition to metformin for the pre-diabetic individual efficacy and side effects, i.e. the two used together. Okay, yes. So two used together. Um, I have used uh, in my practice with diabetic patients, metformin and uh, olive leaf together. Haven't seen any adverse effects in those patients uh, above and beyond what you, you know, would normally expect. Uh, but obviously you would need to more carefully monitor blood sugar levels. Uh, in a pre-diabetic individual, not as much of an issue of monitoring uh, compared to an actual uh, diagnosed diabetic individual. In terms of efficacy, yeah, I, I think the two together, given given the differences in the mechanisms of actions there and the other additional actions that we get from olive leaf extract that can be positive in metabolic syndrome patients. Yeah, I think use the two together. Uh, don't hesitate to do so. Just observe the patient and see how we go. And it'd be great to see a, a number of case reports published about how that combined usage has, has worked out in clinical practice as well. Uh, and final one here, can fresh twigs yield the same amount of olive leaf extract? Uh, no. So the, the twigs are going to have a lot less of, you know, various polyphenols, uh, particularly things like the oleoropine compared to the leaf. So, yeah, it may have other interesting chemistry worth exploring, uh, but, yeah, it's not going to have the, the main ones that we get from the leaf. Thanks so, so much, Ian. I think that's it. Answered all the questions in perfect timing. <laughs> so thank you for that amazing insight into the olive leaf extract research and use. I just want to let everyone know that this webinar has been recorded and will be available to rewatch on the olivewellnessinstitute.org website. So keep a look out for that in the coming days. Thanks everyone for joining and thank you so much, Ian. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for everybody's attention. And yeah, thanks to the Olive Wellness Institute for having me today. Thank you. Bye, everyone.